Some of you know that my father served in the United States Marine Corps as a pilot, an aviator. And he uh, was deployed in the uh, Vietnam War. And he flew a little jet airplane called an A-4. And uh, at some point or another, uh, I had the opportunity to read the citation he received when he was given the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is a medal for service in that war. I think the Distinguished Flying Cross is like the highest medal you can get as a, a for, for being an aviator. And this medal citation tells this incredible story. And my father was flying. He was called in. And he, uh, this, this airplane he flew is an airplane designed to attack the ground from the air. And there was a group of Marines on the ground who had been surrounded by the enemy and were pretty horribly outnumbered. This was a battle they were not going to win. So they call in, they call in to get support. Sometimes that support would be like uh, artillery, you know, a big cannon would fire something. In this case, it was an airplane, probably a group of airplanes. And this metal citation tells the story of my dad flying down, and in this case, the enemy was something like 100 feet away from these Marines. And he flew in and dropped his armaments, and these Marines were saved. So they gave him a medal for that plane came back with bullet holes. What if those Marines had no radio? Or it's even worse to imagine them having a radio and not using it. Last week we talked about the sword of the spirit our the weapon of our warfare which is the word of God and what we might notice in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 is there's two things we pick up with our hands one is the shield of faith and the other is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God so I just want to read this text to you, uh, starting in verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying, praying. <laughs> That's the next word. Take the shield and the sword, praying. It's almost as though he's saying, here's how you get a hold of the shield and the sword, praying. Or I can also imagine, as I can imagine any group of soldiers preparing themselves for battle while they're getting ready, praying. I think it's probably one of the prayingest groups of people ever is a group of soldiers actually picking up their sword and their shield. Praying. Here's something I believe. As soon as you start praying, you are engaged directly in fellowship with the Almighty God. You are doing the very thing Jesus died to 
to provide to you as soon as you begin praying. As it's almost like as soon as you make up your mind to pray, believing that you can pray and actually be heard, then you are engaged in fellowship with the Almighty God, which is the thing Jesus died to provide. To reconcile us to God in himself. To give us, as Romans 5 puts it, standing in grace before God. He says there in Romans chapter 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we have this standing in his grace because of the sacrifice of Christ applied to us by the simple reception of trusting in it. So as soon as you pray, you are doing that most significant thing. I will sometimes say, many of you have probably heard me say before, that the fact that you are praying is more important than anything you might be praying about. The simple fact that you, a sinner, can stand in the presence of God and ask whatever silly thing is on your mind and receive a warm reception from Almighty God, that is a bigger deal than whatever that little thing is that you thought you'd bring. So bring it, whatever it is. Don't worry about it. I say this, all you got to know to pray is what you want. It's simple. You want something? Ask him. He is wise enough not to give you stupid things. Not to give you things that wouldn't be actually good for you, even if that's what you want. He is a totally trustworthy father. And so sometimes when you're asking for candy, he gives you broccoli. Because he knows what he's doing. And so I don't need to worry about it. I can ask for whatever. And the fact that I'm talking to him is the main thing. It is the thing that Jesus died to give me access to. And so Paul says, while we're worrying about the devil and we're taking up our armor and we're putting on Christ, every element of the armor is just one other way of talking about Christ. And we're putting on Christ. The shield we have is our faith in Christ. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is the testimony of the gospel of Christ. So as we're putting on Christ, we are praying. We're praying. As soon as you begin to pray, you are dwelling in victory. I, I need to say this more emphatically. I can't figure out how to say it more emphatically. I didn't say one of the results of your prayer might be that you experience victory. I didn't say that. As soon as you begin praying, you are dwelling in the victory that Christ has already won. You do not pray to get victory. You pray to enjoy it. Because the thing he won for you is standing before Almighty God. 
Are you praying enough? How much does Paul recommend that you pray? Have you heard? He says it in this text also. I think about the prayers that Paul prayed. You know, he starts the book of Ephesians by talking about how he prays for the Ephesians. And here he is closing the book of Ephesians by asking them to pray and to pray for him specifically. And in the middle of the book of Ephesians is this amazing prayer that he's begging God that <laughs> they would be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Do you know that I, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer in Jesus, the thing you really need is to believe in Jesus? Faith. Christ occupying you through faith. Do you know that the Spirit of Christ focuses our attention on Christ? As we've talked about this warfare, and we've talked about the devil's goal, you know, his devil. The, the devil's goal is simple. Distract you from Christ. Get you to live as though you don't have standing before God. Try to convince you that it's not real. Or try to convince you that it's something you gained because of what a wonderful person you are. Try to just keep you alienated from God and from everyone else. That's the devil's goal. Well, guess what the Spirit's goal is? <laughs> the opposite of that. The Spirit's goal is to focus your attention on the truth of God's grace in Christ. So that you will trust in Christ. So that your heart will be occupied by Christ. And your life will be a reflection of the goodness of God to you in Christ. It's very Christ-centered. The work of the Spirit. Jesus said, He'll take the things of mine and give them to you. Pray. Pray, pray. This text has a bunch of descriptions about how Paul is encouraging us to pray. Here's something he does. He uses this word all a lot. Or every. All and every. The, the first thing he says, praying, with every prayer. <laughs> Praying with every prayer. How many of the prayers have you used so far? How close are you to every? How many prayers are there? Every prayer. I take this to mean something like all kinds of praying. In any way you can think of to pray. Pray this way or that way. Pray prayers of thanksgiving. Pray prayers of petition. Pray prayers of rejoicing. Pray, 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 pray every kind of prayer you can think of to pray. Pray it. Every prayer. And it seems kind of unnecessary, but he says, with every prayer and petition. And petition means uh, some sort of urgent need you sense some request. Every prayer and petition. Every way. Pray in every way. Here's another way I take that. Whatever I'm doing, let it be praying. As I go, as I interact with the shopkeeper or the school teacher or anyone else, May that be praying. In other words, 
Might I live every element of my life in the light of the presence of God with me, providing for me, taking care of me? You know, if I'm aware of God's presence taking care of me, then whatever I need from you, I don't really need from you. So if you don't give me what I want, I don't need to be upset by it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm preaching to myself here for a second. I, if I understand the goodness of God in Christ, which says, how can he give us his only son and not also along with him freely give us everything? And in the book of Philippians, in that same chapter we read from earlier, he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to, you know, how carefully you're living the Christian life lately. No, not according to that. According to the quality or the diligence of your faith. No, not according to that. My God shall supply your, all your needs according to his riches in glory. I think that's all your needs. Every prayer, every petition, whatever I think I need, I bring it. Whatever I'm doing, I bring it before him. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Oh, we'll come back to that in a second. So we pray in every way, with all kinds of praying, and with every petition, that means we pray about everything. Have you let some things go by without praying? Well, that's dumb. That's what I want to say to you about it. It's kind of dumb. I don't want to say, oh, you horrible person. God will get you that you let something go by without praying. No, this is 100% opportunity, not burden. It is something you get to do, not something you must do. And if you get to, why on earth don't you? Well, because you're dumb. <laughs> that's all. That's the, the only explanation necessary. Because you forgot that you can. Because if you can, why don't you? In every way about everything. If something looks like a problem to you, pray. Right away. Here's what I do. I don't know about you, but I do this. I pray when I've tried everything else. Dumb. Why am, what am I waiting around for? I think sometimes God will let us try everything else and see to it that everything else does not succeed. Because the thing he's interested in is you conversing with him. Christ died to make that possible for you. So, start with the first thing. Pray. Pray. In every way, about everything, and then he says, at all times. It's like he's kind of repetitive. Praying with every prayer, with every petition, at all times. Whatever's happening, pray. And then he says, in the Spirit, at all times, in the Spirit. Now here's something I believe to be true. I don't think you can pray in Christ and not pray in the Spirit. 
Praying in the Spirit is really the only way you can pray. And probably the only reason you do pray. Because the Spirit is always leading you to pray. And this reminded me of that uh, thing we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and we read this line from the hymn, One little word shall fell him. One little word utterly destroys the work of Satan. And the little word is Abba. The little word is Abba. Father, Father, it's a prayer. It's a prayer. And when we talk about praying in the Spirit, you might read, Gal- you might read Romans chapter 8 where God has given us the Spirit who cries out in us, Abba, Father. Or you might read Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, where the Spirit of Christ is given to us so that we cry, Abba, Father. And when we cry, Abba, Father, guess who's crying along with you? The Spirit. The Spirit. It is always the Spirit that is moving in you if you notice God to be your Abba. (laughs) Because what a crazy good thing that is. Abba, praying in the Spirit. You know, I come to God in Christ and by the Spirit. That's how I can pray. I can stand there before God because Jesus is standing there before God saying, it's all right, he's with me. I know what he looks like, but it's okay, he's with me. And I come before God my only movement, my only impulse to come to God with anything is from the Spirit. It is the Spirit that gives me faith. It is the Spirit that puts Christ in my heart. It is the Spirit who gives me the strength so that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith. And it is in Christ that I can say, Abba. It is the Spirit of Christ, according to Galatians chapter 4. So, he's saying, pray in every kind of praying, about everything, at all times, in the Spirit. Remembering that God is your Abba, Father. And then he says, be alert. Now, this is kind of a term for being on watch, as in looking out for the enemy. Be alert. <laughs> Be alert with all perseverance. I don't, Paul just says these things, and it's like another way of saying the same thing. I think maybe he was trained in Hebrew parallelism where you say a thing and then you say something kind of like it that gives you more to it. Be alert with all perseverance. Stay alert and stay on it like a soldier on watch. Watch for the enemy activity. How do you watch for the enemy activity? I think it's simple. You watch for anything that might distract anyone from Christ. That's a long list. And then you watch for that working on anyone. Because, you know, the devil can use just about anything to distract us from Christ. Our success or our failure, our righteous deeds or our sins. He can use that to distract us, our success. 
just our material needs, our health, or sickness. He'll use whatever's going on at any given time. And so I'm watching for any way that anything might be distracting anyone from Christ. If someone is involved in some sort of idolatrous materialism, I notice that they're being distracted from Christ. I might also notice if someone is involved in some form of Christian legalistic moralism, that they are being distracted from Christ, who has fulfilled the law on our behalf, so that it is now no longer a burden, but now an opportunity for us in Him. And so even our Christianity, the devil can use as a distraction from Christ. And the thing you need is to trust in Christ, not to behave yourself. If you trust in Christ, I'm not too worried about you behaving yourself. But if you focus on behaving yourself and forget about Christ, the devil has won. There's plenty of extremely well-behaved people that will end up in eternal judgment because they don't know Christ. So whatever the devil's using, you watch out for it. And what is the solution? Pray. Pray. Do you know somebody who's wrapped up in something, some giant distraction from Jesus, what will you do? Pray. Oh, and don't forget you got the sword in your hand. Say what God says. Say what God says, if you know it. Stay alert. Stay on it with every prayer and petition for all the saints. Now, this is focused on your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, but I think there's no necessary requirement to limit it to those people alone. Pray for anyone you know. Pray for everyone you know. In fact, in the book of 2 Timothy, or is it 1 Timothy? one of those, where Paul is addressing Timothy to try to help Timothy to deal with a church that's kind of a problematic church. He says, here's the first thing, the very first thing you should do if you are in a church that ha that's not well as a church. If you're in a church where there's conflict or where there's busybodies or all kinds of gossip or blah, blah, blah. Problem church? First of all, he says, get everyone praying. Get everyone praying. And then he says, and pray for everyone. He says, even kings Even those politicians that are persecuting you, pray. In, in fact, the prayer in that passage in Timothy is for everyone. He says, get them praying in every way for everyone. How, do, how does that make the church get better? Well, it focuses them on the good news that we are here to proclaim in the world. If I'm praying for the president... What will I ask for? Well, what would be above that he might see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? I can't think of anything that would be above that. Pray for everyone. So here we are, we're praying in every way, about everything, at all times, in the Spirit, Staying alert, watching out for how the devil's working to distract us, praying about that, and praying for everyone. 
I don't know. Do you get the idea that prayer might be important? And then he says, pray for me also. Pray for me. Now, I'm not sure if we should today take this uh, and apply it directly, as in, here we are, church, let's pray for the Apostle Paul. I don't, I don't know that... I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident he might be praying for us, but I don't know if we're supposed to keep praying for him. So how do we apply this? Well, what does he say? What does he ask them to pray for him? It's this, that I might be given the words when I begin to speak. That I might be given the words. You remember what Jesus said that, you know, don't worry when he was talking to the disciples. He says, don't, don't worry too much about planning too hard what you're going to say when you're called before the leaders. The Spirit will give you the words. Paul's saying, pray for that for me. Pray for that for me. Pray that I might speak. When I speak, that I would get the words. And, but he's not just praying for any old words. He goes on, that I might confidently make known, that I might boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Now, right here, he reminds us that he is stuck. The Apostle Paul is in prison when he wrote this. He's under some kind of house confinement, and he's got Roman soldiers there with him all the time. And that is when he says, pray for me so that I can speak and speak boldly and boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I think what we're being asked to pray for here is skillful wielding of the sword. that we might be skillful in speaking the word of God to people and to be bold about it and to have the specific guidance of the Spirit in doing so so that it's skillful I don't know if you've ever seen somebody use the sword of the Spirit like it was a club to beat the head of another person. But the sword of the Spirit is not for that. It is for the refined taking down of arguments on behalf of the person. And so when I go to wield the sword of the Spirit, it is not to win an argument with this guy. It is to win this guy by destroying the arguments of the enemy. Might be some skill involved. I think there is. And so I want the help of the very Spirit of God to give me the right words for the right person at the right time so that with boldness I can say what God says. And what God says is Christ. Jesus, the man, is the Word of God made flesh. Hebrews 1 says, God has spoken in a lot of ways at a lot of times in the old days through the prophets in all kinds of ways. But in these days, the here lately, God has spoken to us in His Son who is the exact representation of His being. 
And so if I want to know what I'm boldly proclaiming, the answer is Christ. And I need the skill of some basis in the whole word of God in Scripture to exercise my use of the sword skillfully so that I'm not going after the one who is not my enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers. We are not fighting the person we're talking to. We are fighting for that person as we apply the Word of God. All of this is for prayer. <laughs> All of this is my hope that somehow this person, that the Spirit of God would reveal the glory of God in the face of Christ to this person. And they might learn of the open door to the throne of grace so that they might become someone who prays. It is the goal <laughs> to become praying people. So, again, I want to say, though, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. This is not some sort of burden to take on yourself. But it is every moment of every day available to you. And it's really dumb if you don't take advantage of that. Father, we pray <laughs> that you would work in us to pray. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the Spirit of Christ who dwells in us. Lord, as we come to the table this morning, we come to receive. We recognize the new covenant in the blood of Christ. And we say that is for me. This open door by His body and blood is for me. This opportunity to address Almighty God as my Abba. Yes, Lord. Yes. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.